here we are in the week where uh, yesterday all the sort of Twitterati people were uh, just going on and on about, you know, same-sex marriage. And then here we are today, the next day, with all the Twitterati going on about Mother's Day. There's no irony there then. We live in a sort of world, the same sort of world that Paul is dealing with as he writes to Titus on Crete. Because the island of Crete is a chaotic shambles morally. Uh, they are full of, uh, renowned in the ancient world for being a bunch of liars. They're renowned for drunkenness. They're renowned for immorality. And that's amongst the pagans, they're renowned for that. And Paul and Titus have been on this preaching mission all around the island. And little churches have sprung into being in the midst of all of that. And, of course, they have problems, the sort of problems you'd expect people to bring into church with them when they're coming into church first time round. Yeah? So Paul is writing to Titus and he's saying, in each of those places, appoint men who will be there to teach the Bible to the people in these churches. Elders in every congregation, the way I've told you. Go and do all of that. And now, he says in chapter 2, this is what you're to teach. Put those guys in place. Now, you as the example and the model to those guys... You teach this. You must teach that which is in accord with sound doctrine. And again, yesterday in this, this big gathering of Christian people for this lovely young fellas, gifted young fellas induction, again, we're having this conversation. It's not enough just to teach sound doctrine. We must also, that is crucial. We've got to teach the truth, right? Because that's, Jesus said, you know the truth and the truth will set you free. But we have got to teach that which is in accord with it. By which Paul then goes on to show, he means a life that is consistent with the truth that's being taught in the church. So we, we, we learn the truth and then we go and live a life that flows from that truth. And we've used that illustration, I used it again yesterday chatting with quite a few people, of the stick of rock from the seaside, you know? And the pink letters go all the way through the stick of rock. And we need that truth to be running all through the lives of God's people consistently. Making sense? Now we'll slip and we'll slide and we'll fail. So Paul goes right on and he says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to men. It is that grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and say no to worldly passions, right? So it's back to the grace of God every time. But it is that grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, what God has done for us with Jesus, dying on the cross, paying the price of our sin, giving us a new life in Christ. That's what drives us and motivates us to live a distinctive life for him. Okay, we saw already then Paul's reminding Titus at the end of chapter 2 about the things he should teach, that in that complex and difficult situation on Crete he should teach and rebuke with all authority. Let nobody despise him because he's taking this position. It's the truth. Stand for it like it is the truth. He must know how to speak authoritatively as the servant of God. He must be ready to stand up for it. He must be ready to teach those things. And this must happen in the home, he was very clear about that in chapter 2, and in the state. In the state. So, how should we then behave towards rulers in the state because the grace of God has appeared? We've had that interesting, interesting thing of um, people who lead our country, people who lead in our land, taking a position on moral issues that's the opposite of what God would say about them. We've had that this last week again. Okay? We've got again the situation where um, we have vicars on, I tweeted about this in the week, caused quite a fuss, uh, vicars on Radio 4 saying, uh, I want to marry my gay partner, the vicar is saying, not me, <laughs> you get the pictures, not me, the vicar is saying, I want to marry my gay partner because it's right. And you end up thinking, in what sense is that right? Somebody is defining right as being what I would like. Not as what God uncomfortably says. And from time to time he does say things that are uncomfortable, doesn't he? And we're back to his grace. We're back to his mercy towards us to motivate us to live his way. We're back to his, his grace to, to strengthen us and help us because we slip and slide along the way and we need his mercy every day, don't we? We do stuff we shouldn't be doing all the time. And it's back to his mercy and it's back to his grace. How does that condition then, how does that condition the way that you will behave as a Christian in the state? How will it, how, what is behavior in accord with sound doctrine towards rulers? 
Now, that's a really big question for Paul because he's living in the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire is no democracy. It's not even an enlightened dictatorship that Paul is dealing with here. Paul, not so long after this now, is going to be taken along the Appian Way early one morning and they're going to chop his head off because he follows Jesus. Christians, left and right, are being dragged off to court, to prison, to the amphitheatre in his day. And here Paul says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good subject and obedient now hupotasamai is the verb it's the appropriate posture towards legitimate authority it's taking your place in state and society we've got a place in the order of things you know we fit somewhere and it's it's a, above some it's under some wherever it happens to be to be in the right place to take the right posture towards legitimate authority to respect authority that has been put over you there is a God we believe there's a God we believe there is a sovereign God that he does what pleases him that's hard some days isn't it but that's what we believe and we cling to that you know this verb calls for the recognition and the acceptance of proper authority by acting and by developing attitudes that are right and appropriate is that your attitude to government to who Paul spells it out, doesn't he? Subject obedient to rulers and authorities. All official powers are to be shown the deference that reflects the fact that God is the one who's ordered society. And that subjection or respect for God's order in society isn't to be merely theoretical. The rubber's got to hit the road. It's not just, oh, I'm theor theoretically subject. We obey. So when it comes to the tax form, we reflect our Christian faith on the tax form. When it comes to meeting our civil requirements in society, I had somebody down last week to say, from the, from the highway authority, you've got to trim your edges. So what do I say? On your bike, sort yourself out, I'll, I'll look after my edges, you go away. No, we don't say that. We say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, let's, let's, can you show me what you mean? Because I think I'm okay, and blah, 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 blah. And somebody's complaining, and the worst, the worst of it is it's the other side of the road, but you're going to cop it because they can't find out who owns the other side. You know something? Okay, we're going to be subject to the authorities. We're going to pay attention. We're going to be good boys. Because we seek to live in accord with sound doctrine. So, Why is that now not working? Oh, it works if you do that, does it? Well, anyway, doing good. <laughs> not just in a negative sort of way, subject and obedient, but actually doing good. It's not just a negative thing. It's not just a sort of through gritted teeth submission. That, that isn't the half of it. It's not fulfilling the bare minimum legal requirement to sneak us out of the thing, but... It is a matter of going on beyond that. Now look, here's what God has done in Jesus. Here's how it's in accord with sound doctrine. Here's how it's in accord with the grace of God. God hasn't just done the bare minimum to sneak us out from underneath the judgment of God. He's gone beyond that. And Paul is saying here, it cons consistent with that principle, go beyond. Do what is required, go more. God has saved us from our sin, yeah, but he's adopted us as sons into his family. That's over and above. God hasn't just seen that our sins are forgiven. He's clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. He's gone beyond, you see? And Paul is saying, take that principle and apply it beyond. Don't just be subject and obey the authorities. Go beyond. Do good. Doing that which is good. The gospel doesn't do just the bare minimum. It takes us on from beyond that. God goes beyond that. So, who is running the bulk of the food banks in our land? It is right that it should be the Christian church. Who is it who is running the non-state funded job clubs? It's the church. Who is it who sponsors the youth and children's work and young mothers outreach support work? Who is it that voluntary care for the elderly? 
It ought to be those who are living in accord with sound doctrine. Because you don't just do the minimum and obey, you go beyond. Yeah? Strains of motherhood here, it is Mother's Day. I'm going to just refer to that. You know, a mother doesn't just do the bare minimum, food and clothes. A mother goes beyond. There's love and there's care, which is all part of the deal. Going beyond. The grace of God teaches us that principle. So here's a great implied contrast between what God's faithful servants and those people who are in error on Crete, trying to lead the Crete church astray, what they're going to look like. Okay, that's not our motivation, but that is a, that is a, a fact to bear in mind. So there's the way we behave towards rulers, and the grace of God teaches us to go down that sort of road. How do we behave towards other citizens then? Well, the grace of God teaches us not to slander people. God didn't make himself look better by making us look bad. That's the bottom line, isn't it? God could have tried to make himself look betrayed. God always does what he tries to do, but you know what I mean. Um, God could have made himself look better at our expense. He didn't. God, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, comes and looks bad for us. Yeah? Yeah? He himself bore that curse. Paul writes about it, doesn't he? He says, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. He bore the curse of sin. He looked bad. He put himself in the position where he'd go in the temple courts every day and he'd preach and he'd teach. And the things he had to pe preach and teach were being taught to people who were sort of off track somewhere. So it made him look bad to them. He, he came and became the son of a carpenter, not the biggest Pharisee in the land. He came and made himself look bad to put us right. So why is it we don't go around slandering people? Because by, you know, from the grace of God, we learn this principle. Not to slander, not to make other people look bad to make ourselves look good, but to pick people up. Is that making sense? It's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. Where's my point of God? I need it back. <laughs> so there we are. Paul says, don't slander other citizens, right? All those disputes that are going on in Crete, all those disagreements in the church that are going on in Crete, resist the temptation to slander one another because that's not how God has responded to you. Don't slander others, but be peaceable. What has God done at the cross? He has made peace between God, who is rightly offended, and human beings who are right out of order. Yeah? He's made peace between the two. Bring him to, through his blood shed on the cross, it says. He's come close to us and he's made peace. God was pleased, Colossians 1, 19, to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth and things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross now do you want people to believe that we want people to believe that don't we that his blood shed on the cross has made peace well we need to reflect it then because cretan behavior is not considerate No slander, peaceable, considerate. God considered the mess we got ourselves into in our sin. And he sent his Jesus to resolve it. Yeah? Considerate. The Cretan behaviour, by reputation, is not considerate. But it says here, be not contentious, be considerate. Okay, so people come along and they push us around and they try and, you know give us trouble and try and give us grief yeah just you know sometimes it's tough having a living Jesus to follow we need to be considerate to those people considerate of their problems considerate of their difficulties considerate of the score as to what is actually going on and universally kind now that is a tough one showing kindness to all people it says there in Titus 3 it's a tough challenge why is it a tough challenge because people are not very nice. It's true, isn't it? I mean, why did God send his son to die on the cross? He sends his son to die on the cross because people are not very nice. People not being nice is at the heart of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not, everybody's nice. It's not, it passes like that, you know? No, people are not. <laughs> you know? That's not the truth, is it? So, here comes God and he sends his Jesus to deal with people who are not very nice to deal with sinners like us and to deal with people that we consider to be a lot worse than we are sometimes hard to deal with that because the people he brings in are not necessarily our type of people 
universally kind. God has been universally kind by sending his Jesus because he's not fussy about who his love brings. Not always easy to deal with. They may not look like us, behave like us, smell like us, eat like us, <laughs> fit in. <laughs> the church is the only organisation I really know of where you know, it, it does well, it thrives when there's all this mix of humanity. Well, let your behaviour be in accord with sound doctrine in the state. And here's, here's what it's all about. And now Paul says, OK, now I'm coming to the rationale. Here's what we're going to do. Here's why. Verses 3 to 8. It's all about the grace of God that brings salvation. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. They're unprofitable. They're useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. And after that, have nothing to do with them. There's the verses I was looking for. This is what you've got to go for. Don't have anything to do with people who are not doing this. This is what it's about. Here's why we're going to do those things and behave the way you've said in the state. Because at one time, we too were. Our personal history. Think of what you were like. You're going to start pointing the finger at people and throwing bricks at people because they're this and they're that. What have you been? What are you? You know? Our whole position as Christians is that we are sinful human beings and we need the grace of God. Consider what you were. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Have you noticed how unpleasant people can be to one another? Nice people, tidy people, backbiting. See, the Bible's a very practical book, isn't it? It's right right down to earth at one time historically our lives were not conditioned by the doctrines of God's grace and we were therefore not living in accord with sound doctrine how did that look foolish foolish anoetos not understanding not intelligent unwise if you listen to the new atheists and, and the militant evangelists of new atheism amongst the stand-up comedians and people like that it's the, it's the opposite. They try and make the point that the Christians are the, the, the simpletons. That's a reversal. The unconverted, whether they are dissolute pagans like the Cretans or unconverted religious people like Paul, fools without Christ, he says. The heavens declare the glory of God and they settle for worshipping created things rather than the creator who made all that. That's foolish. That's foolish. Now, dissolute living does that for you. Religion doesn't do it for you. Rebellion or distraction take you to the same place. Folliesville, Kentucky. They make a fool of you. Ever since Psalm 14, it's been the fool who says in his heart, there's no God. It's the fool who says in his heart, there's no God. Disobedient, deceived. Yep, been there. That's what we were about. Believe in the lie the devil has propagated since Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, that sin is without consequences. That sin represents the most rewarding way to lead your life. Deceived by all kinds of passions and pleasures. See, this is the thing about faith being a moral choice, isn't it? It's all kinds of passions and pleasures that lead you astray to, to justify in that by all sorts of means that you're going to believe. How much better than to live for everything that is in accord with sound doctrine? Why couldn't people work this out for themselves? Why, why has God got to point it out? Well, it goes like this, really. It, people are living in a rat race, and being in a rat race, the thing is, you're a rat amongst racing rats. Is that how it works? You're living in a rat race, and, and you're a rat amongst racing rats. And it doesn't feel safe to be anything other than a rat in a world that's like that. It takes quite a lot to trust God to come out of that, doesn't it? Because some rat's going to bite you. <laughs> Unless you bite him back. You're in the rat race. You're a racing rat amongst racing rats. And unless somebody comes into that situation and pulls you out of that into a safe place, you don't feel secure enough in that situation to do anything but go on behaving like a racing, fighting rat. Does that make sense? Until you've got the trust in him, it isn't safe to change. I, I'm not expressing that terribly well, am I? But, but you get the idea. 
Here's the thing. At the cross, as we stand at the foot of the cross and we begin to look at what God was willing to do for me, and as we begin to understand the extent of his actual love and care for me, then I begin to realize perhaps it might be safe to stop being a racing rat. But until I see that, until I see the security of the Christian in Christ, that he's never going to let me go, if he loves me that much, he's never going to let me go, then I'm not safe to stop being a racing rat. Is that making sense? I need to know I'm safe to step out of that. And it's considering the grace of God in Christ that enables you to do that. It is the grace of God that brings salvation that's appeared to men, that, that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Until then, you're a racing rat. And it doesn't feel safe to get out of there. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. It's not a good way to be. That was our personal history, racing rats in a rat race. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. We needed to see him appear. Not because of righteous things we'd done. That's not how you get to be a Christian. That's not how you get put right with God. But because of his mercy. It's all down to him. It's all his initiative. It's his doing. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, through renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously, through Jesus Christ our Saviour. There's where, there's how, that's how it works. By God's gracious intervention, we're set free from that personal history we've had. Yeah? And there's a point. It's not, okay, let's all sit here now being smug then. That's great, that's true of me. There's a point. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs. Having the hope of eternal life. God has begun something in my heart. He's begun changing me. There was a guy who became a Christian in our first church plant donkeys years ago in Gravesend. And Bob was a bus driver. Remember Bob? And uh, Bob's wife started coming to something Helen was running and really made a big impression on her. She became a Christian. And there was Bob. And Bob was sort of racking his head around, all, what's this Christian stuff? You know, poor bloke. And he was going off to work every day in his London bus garage, driving his bus. And the guy started saying, you all right, Bob? Yeah, fine. She's different, what's the matter? I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay. Next day, Bob, what, what's up? Are you okay, mate? What's the matter? Why are you asking me? Well, because you're not swearing all the time. And you're not all the time. And Bob, who doesn't believe yet, is saying, what's going on? What's happening to me? And I went up to see him that evening. He sent for me, actually, I think he did. And I went up to have a chat and get the Bible out again with him and pray and read with him and stuff. And he said, you know, I had, no, I had no evidence for God at all, he said. But now what's happening is this. The biggest evidence I've got for God is the way he's changing me. And the guys are saying this. I, I said, time to give in, boy. <laughs> you know, it's time to give in. Put it up, you know, get it straight now. Like, let's do it now. So he did. And I baptised him. And it was great.